Shall I start? Okay. Yeah. Um, hi there. Uh, so I was sort of uh, I, I've been asked to talk about the the reconstruction of Coventry after its very heavy bombing in 1940. And uh, sorry, sorry, Owen. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I have to interrupt you. I um, I think that uh, I need to introduce you and uh, to I say was, a few I words. I was thinking that might happen, but there was a little a little pause, okay. and I was like, "Yeah, sorry, sorry about that." Okay. But I think it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Hi guys. First of all, we have to say thank you that in these dark times you you are finding the time and and uh, strongness to. Um, to be here, to uh, to be invited, and to, to to listen to lectures, to these events that are aiming to think about the future, and of course, together we are strong. The organizer of this event is the Propiam uh, School, the School of uh, Project Management of Building Projects. Uh, that in um, other times, not not also in war times, uh, teach. Uh, teaches project management and professionals of uh, building industry and increase their uh, their qualifications, their professionalism in, in terms of business management. And uh, the mission of the school is to change the culture of uh, building, culture of construction in Ukraine, which we know is very important because we are, uh, we are going to Europe I hope soon we, we will be officially in Europe, but at the same time, we need to increase the quality of our construction industry to be in Europe in the uh, in the sense as it should be. Uh, at the same time, Britain is going into another direction, but it's <laughs> it's another topic. So the, um, I'm a moderator of this event. My name is Dmitro. I'm a founder of RNG Architects. Uh, we are dealing with uh, computational architecture, contemporary architecture, and uh, of course now we are trying to to do everything we can to to support Ukrainian architecture and economy. Also, we provided the solution for one of the solution for uh, refugees in terms of uh, modular living, but as one of the one of the uh, att uh, attendant said that uh, there is nothing more, uh, nothing more uh, constant than temporary. That's why this solution should be uh, high quality, and we should think how we use these temporary solutions afterwards, after the war. And <clears throat> now, uh, now there are many professions among uh, among the. Uh, listeners among our listeners yeah. for instance uh, we, we have different range of uh, attendees from students to CEOs of different companies uh, the representatives of Archie Kids Festival um, also the travel agency uh, workers uh, even lawyers uh, also individual and individual entrepreneurs and um, uh, development companies and many many others so it means that everyone is interested to hear and to, to get some knowledge from from Owen and um, the timing will be something like 40 45 minutes for the speech itself uh, and after that we'll have, uh, about 25 30 minutes for questions and answers and uh, let me introduce you Owen Hatterley uh, editor author uh, will be speaking about the country rebuilt uh, the British city which has many uh, many mutual characteristics with contemporary Ukrainian cities which are being under the shellings and bombardments. Uh, so uh, please welcome Owen. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, so um, 
Hi there. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the reconstruction of Coventry after its very heavy bombing in 1940. And I think it's first worth talking about the ways in which that is and isn't a similar situation. Um, in terms of the simple kind of um, amount that was destroyed, you know, the centre of Coventry was so heavily destroyed in 1940 that the Germans coined a new term, Coventryeren, for a particularly destroyed city. So it contributed to the German language there. Um, but obviously the thing with Britain is that it was never occupied. So it faced, you know, in many ways... It's not a popular view in Britain, but in many ways it had a much easier war than, um, than places that were on the Eastern Front. Um, but there was obviously significant destruction. And after the Second World War, there were various cities, I think, which kind of became sort of global exemplars of how you reconstruct a city um, on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And um, they would be... Coventry, Rotterdam, and Warsaw, I think, in particular. Um, and they all took quite different kind of uh, approaches. But a lot of people in Britain have often been quite critical of the Coventry approach and sort of been rather kind of, uh, sort of uh, wished they had the Warsaw approach, let's say, which was to sort of reconstruct as much as possible of the old town that was destroyed by the Nazis um, as a response to the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. Um, that kind of total historical reconstruction is not a thing that happened in um, Coventry, and it's not a thing that happened in Western Europe in general. Um, it went for a much more sort of modernist approach, and we can sort of discuss afterwards the degree, I think, to which we think that was the correct approach. I think it has a lot going for it, but it's got flaws, which we'll come to. Um, so there's really kind of like six six kind of um, sort of headings under which I want to put this before I go into pictures, because I'm mostly going to tell the story via slides. First, some historical images and then my own amateur photographs. Um, first of all, it's context, the kind of city Coventry was before it was bombed. The second is the extent of the bombing and the, the, the speed of the replanning. The third is the kind of city that they wanted to rebuild, what sort of values it would have, who would own it, what its public spaces would be like. Um, the fourth is the way that it kind of um, approached sort of, I guess one could say questions of ideology. Um, it kind of... Um, Coventry very much um, saw itself very consciously as the sort of great sort of city of peace after the war. And so it had, you know, these kind of um, artistic and ideological kind of um, messages encoded in lots of its buildings and public spaces. The fifth point I want to talk about is the decline of post-war Coventry, which um, does undergo a quite sharp decline from um, the late 1970s onwards. And then at the end, I want to bring the story up to date with the city's kind of recent function as uh, the British capital of culture last year, but also the ways in which lots of that kind of reconstructed historical centre, the, the kind of new city built in the 50s, has been under significant threat in recent years. So in amongst all of that, I'm not going to do a kind of like, here are the lessons you can learn, because I think a lot of the lessons will be very different. Um, you know, if one were comparing it with sort of bombed cities such as Kharkiv or, or a completely kind of flattened city such as Mariupol, um, we're obviously kind of um, talking about a different level of scale. Um, but also, you know, you can sort of draw on all of these different kind of approaches over the years. Um, I've always thought the kind of most sort of chilling possibility of the end of this is, you know, these cities being rebuilt in much the same way that, let's say, Grozny was rebuilt by the Russians after the Chechen War. And I think that's that's the worst case scenario in this, which um, I think we all very much hope will not happen. Um, but so these are the kind of other historical scenarios which could be more, more appealing. Um, so I'm going to start the slides now. I'm going to do the share screen. I don't have a PowerPoint because they always crash. Um, so I'm going to do this via share screen instead. Right then.
So this is the kind of um, iconic image, let's say, of, hang on, we should check, you can definitely see this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so um, this is the kind of I iconic image of reconstructed Coventry. This is a, a sketch of an early version, this isn't entirely what was built, of Coventry Cathedral, which was destroyed in 1940 by the, um, the, the Nazi bombing. Um, and rather than kind of reconstruct the cathedral to something in some way resembling what it once would have looked like before the bombing, there was a first a preservation of the ruins. So the building was not patched up. It was just simply what was left of it was stabilised. And this new cathedral was built alongside. So this picture is, is one of several by the architect Basil Spence, who published um, a book on the, recon on, on the cathedral and that part of the reconstruction called Phoenix and Coventry, which was a bestseller in the 1960s. Um, and so here you can kind of get a picture of that kind of Coventry ethos, that you preserve some of the ruins and then you start anew. So here is a photograph of Coventry, an aerial photograph of Coventry in 1930. Um, and it kind of gives you a bit of a sense of what sort of city it was. Um, it's in the West Midlands in Britain, which are a kind of very sort of sprawling, somewhat suburban um, industrial area of sort of several different towns and cities which kind of fade into each other, kind of Coventry suburbs eventually become Birmingham suburbs, which become Dudley suburbs, which become Wolverhampton suburbs. They're all kind of, they're all this kind of huge sort of mass of um, coal mining and steel and so forth, and coal mining at one point, um, steel, but particularly motor manufacturing and consumer industries. And this is where Coventry really came in. Coventry was a major city for the motor industry, for the British motor industry, um, for a lot of light engineering, things like bicycles and so forth. And because of that kind of skilled um, high-tech work that happened there, it was a major city for the building of munitions, for war technologies in both the First and the Second World War. So um, alongside that, it was also a medieval city. So you can see here the cathedral, you can see some of the churches, so it had this kind of like very, very tightly packed medieval historical centre where there'd been a lot of rebuilding, but on that medieval plan. Um, and at the same time, kind of the, the immediately outside the centre, it was this kind of industrial powerhouse. So here you have one of the early, uh, early car factories, this is the Daimler factory. Um, so there was a lot, a lot of this. And this, this combination really is one is the major reason why Coventry was so heavily bombed. So this is the cathedral in 1940. And on the one hand, it had, you know, we all know about the, the idea of bombing a place of so-called military significance frequently involves the killing of huge quantities of civilians. And frequently the line between, you know, a military target and a civilian target is extremely thin. Um, and this was certainly the case of Coventry. So on the one hand, it was bombed because of its industrial significance and the fact that it was producing a lot of weaponry. It was also bombed because it was an important historical city. So one of the kind of, um, kind of terms that was used at the time by the Nazis was the so-called Baedeker Raid. So Baedeker was a kind of, uh, you know, a sort of lonely planet of its time, let's say, a kind of um, a series of guidebooks um, to historic cities. And in 1940 and 1941, the Nazis basically kind of went through, you know, more or less went through those guidebooks and bombed historic cities um, as a sort of particular, particularly kind of targeting cultural monuments. Um, so there's a sort of, there's a fairly sort of sadistic um, way of just destroying, you know, sort of cultural artifacts. Again, something that people will be very familiar with. Um, so those two, two things are kind of at the heart of why Coventry was hit so hard. The reconstruction also, first reconstruction plans also happened very, very, very soon after the war. Um, so this is one of the rejected reconstruction plans um, from 1941. And 
if you read a lot of the kind of planners that were involved in the reconstruction of Coventry, particularly the, its first city architect, um, Donald Gibson, they were in some ways pleased isn't really the word I would use, but they were um, they had been waiting to do this for a long time. There had been very much this kind of view that, that the way that cities like Coventry were planned didn't work, that, you know, they were very congested, that there were very large slums, there was a very gap, big gap between rich and poor. It was very difficult to plan them because of just how much the, um, the ownership structure was very, very complicated. Um, and for a lot of town planners, and this is rather macabre, but certainly this is how Donald Gibson saw it, um, the Nazis gave them an opportunity. So they were able to kind of build the city that they wanted um, because of the destruction. So there's various kind of proposals were, 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 were discussed in Coventry in the 1940s. They were discussed extensively in the British press. Um, there were exhibitions in the city that were very popular. It was, you know, it was a very kind of important part in many ways of British wartime propaganda that this is what was going to happen. And that's tied up with other things that were happening at the time. So tied up with the Beveridge Report, which was a government report advocating the creation basically of a welfare state. Um, the creation of the socialised National Health Service after the war, and this general movement towards the sort of more egalitarian, sort of dem democratic socialist kind of future for, um, for Britain, and that Coventry's reconstruction was seen as part of that project. So this is the winning competition, basically. This is Donald Gibson's reconstructed Coventry um, in the original drawings. Um, so the first thing you can see in comparison of the 1930s city is how much space there is. That that kind of like huddle of medieval streets is completely swept away. And instead you have this kind of open space, regular buildings, flat roofs and geometry. And the city is kind of reconstructed on several axes, one around the cathedral and increasingly around new high rise blocks. So um, each kind of like, one of these sort of uh, wide pedestrian squares and streets would end at a particular view. So this is Coventry last December. Um, this is that precinct as built. This is one of the fountains as part of this precinct. Um, so the, sorry, I should first of all come talk about the word precinct because that's an important part. So the idea was very much that rather than kind of reconstructing along the old streets, that you would have these kind of new kind of blocks in space and pedestrian space and often green space, um, which wouldn't follow those rules and would be kind of entirely for, 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 for people to kind of walk in and so forth and that wouldn't, wouldn't have cars, wouldn't have traffic. Um, and they also often had multiple levels. So a lot of Coventry was built with a kind of upper level walkway that you can walk across, creating these kind of new, somewhat futuristic views of the city. Um, a lot of the buildings were also kind of on piloti and the kind of Le Corbusier idea of kind of buildings hold up on pilotis. Um, and the architecture was in something sort of between modernism and the kind of classical tradition. It was a sort of compromised architecture that wasn't quite one or the other under Donald Gibson. Um, this is, again, a very typical part of it. And this shows how later on in the 60s and 70s, these high-rise blocks were kind of placed at the end of these, um, of these pedestrian squares. There's another one. This is the Bull Yard, which is currently under threat. A slightly later pedestrian precinct um, here with the Christmas market that was there around Christmas when I was last there. And there was also a lot of kind of new construction in the suburbs. So this is the sort of city centre idea, it was, you know, being pedestrian spaces, very planned, very spacious, very regular, with a kind of deliberate attempt at there not being a kind of, um, outside of the kind of spires of the cathedral and the old churches, it's a very sort of egalitarian, sort of everything on the same level approach. Um, but obviously there was also significant bombing in the suburbs and in the industrial areas and the working class areas. And there were also kind of plans for expanding the city during this era, because again, after the war, it became an industrial boom town again, and a lot of people were moving there. So one of these new projects is the University of Warwick, 
which you can see here, designed partly by the um, Slovak emigre architect uh, Eugene Rosenberg, who fled the, um, the Nazi takeover of Czechoslovakia in 1938, um, previously practiced in Prague. And it's very much, you know, if you know kind of Prague modern architecture from the 20s and 30s, you'll know that that's where this is coming from. It's very similar style. Um, so this kind of new university on the outskirts of Coventry um, also sort of specialised on a lot of, kind of technological subjects and engineering. So, you know, there's very much a lot of investment in science and technology that was going on at this point, as well as in the arts. Um, and a lot of these new universities became kind of very famous in the 60s and 70s for being the kind of um, sites of experimentation and later on somewhat of alternative culture, let's say. There was also a um, very large new working class suburbs. So this is a mosaic in the city centre by the, um, the architectural writer and painter uh, Gordon Cullen. And lots of these, so some of these uh, images are of the city centre. You can see the cathedral here. But most of them are of Tile Hill. And Tile Hill was a new public housing estate built for the people that were basically the people that were working in the engineering factories in Coventry. Um, as you can see here of these high rises, it's very much the same sort of thing that was happening kind of everywhere in Europe, sort of mostly in Western Europe in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s, and then in Eastern Europe as well in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, you know, sort of flat roofs, blocks in space, prefabrication, you know, you know the story. So that gives you a kind of sense of, of how the reconstruction of the city was approached. Um, and within all of that, there's one point I really want to stress, which is one about ownership. Um, and those planners very much were kind of concerned by the, um, you know, the kind of chaotic ownership of the city before the war and the way that it made planning very difficult. And essentially, the city centre was bought out by the city council. So the city council, the kind of elected local authority, um, the municipality, took over the city, took over the city centre. They owned it. They, um, you know, controlled it in both an economic and political sense. And because of that, they were able to kind of plan it as a whole throughout. And we can talk afterwards about whether or not we think this is a good or bad thing. But it's absolutely impossible to imagine what happened in Coventry without this, without the complete nationalisation, basically. Sorry, of the city yeah. uh, sorry we, we have one suggestion from the auditory. Uh, some some of the people ask you to, to speak a little bit slower. <laughs> yeah, sorry. A little sorry. bit more slowly. Uh, so, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, no so. problem, no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you've kind of, uh, anyway... That's, so that, that particular point, I think, is worth bearing in mind about ownership, that, that, that you couldn't have done any of this without having public ownership of the, of the city centre. So that's, that's the kind of second kind of part of, the, of, of how I wanted to describe the reconstruction. Um, but what I now want to talk about is the way that kind of um, ideas and ideology and I guess kind of art really were a part of the reconstruction and the way in which it became a kind of object of propaganda. So there is probably no city in Britain which has more kind of... Um, modern art on the streets that has more kind of mosaics, public sculptures, relief sculptures, stained glass, and so forth in Britain than Coventry. Um, it has huge quantities of 20th century public art on the streets. This is one example. This is um, a relief sculpture on the facade of the Herbert Gallery which is the main um, art gallery in Coventry, which was built after the bombing was um, completed in the early 1950s to um, one of Donald Gibson's designs. 
Um, but there are so many kind of examples around the city, and I want to kind of talk about them and a, a bit about the way in which they expressed the ideas behind the reconstruction. So some of it was pure nostalgia. Um, so Coventry as a medieval city has a great many myths, has stories about itself. It has kind of, um, you know, sort of tales that are proverbial in, in the English language and English culture. And one of them is the story of Lady Godiva, who for reasons that I can't really remember, had to walk naked on a horse through the city of Coventry. Um, I'm sure someone will, you know, remind me of exactly why she had to do this, but I don't remember. Anyway, at one of the kind of main squares in Coventry, there is a clock which on the hour, when the clock chimes, um, Lady Godiva emerges on her horse, as you can see here, and she walks across the balcony. And then above is a little niche in which um, the notorious Peeping Tom pops out of the niche and uh, looks at her, um, for which, I, as I recall, he was severely punished. So there's this kind of, you know, I guess a sort of lightness to a lot of the reconstruction, a sort of humour to a lot of the reconstruction. And that, I think, is one of the things that makes it very unlike the reconstruction of cities that were destroyed in the Second World War on the other side of the Iron Curtain, such as uh, Minsk and Kiev and so forth, um, that where a lot of the kind of reconstruction um, was sort of very bombastic and pompous and kind of grandiose. Whereas in Coventry, there was often a sort of, I guess, a sort of friendliness and lightness to it. Although in some of the sculpture, as you can see here, you're dealing with something quite close to socialist realism um, with these kind of large, heroic kind of uh, worker figures um, around one of the main squares. And it's worth pointing out here that the politics of reconstructed Coventry were very much unambiguously from the left. Um, initially, I guess, sort of social democratic or democratic socialist, but the, um, the city's main planner in the 1960s and city architect in the 1960s, Arthur Ling, was a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, and that very much has an effect on some of the ideas. One way you can see that is in Coventry Market. So um, Coventry Market um, was built as a kind of rotunda in the um, early 1960s. Um, Again, it's sort of full of sort of um, different kinds of uh, public art all over the place. Um, but in one corner, and they've kind of a very neglected corner now of the market, this is not exactly the, the most attractive part of the market, um, is this very large mural by an artist from Dresden. And that idea of um, sort of getting people from Dresden to work in... Um, Coventry was a very popular one at the time and very much part of this kind of idea, and you can see a bit more of the mural here, um, very much part of this kind of uh, post-war reconciliation. And Dresden is a city which obviously the British had bombed incredibly severely, far more severely than Coventry was bombed. Um, the idea of trying to promote kind of reconciliation through, um, through architecture and through art was very, very popular in Coventry at the time. Um, a lot of the artwork was much more kind of straightforward, didn't have a kind of political aspect to it. So this is one of several relief sculptures on columns outside the cooperative department store. Um, just as this is, you know, some cricket posts and some people swimming and, you know, just kind of scenes of leisure. Um, this is a, a neon sculpture, one of several neon sculptures outside shops in the precincts designed by Arthur Ling in the 1960s. So these kind of neon sculptures have a lovely kind of, you know, slightly futuristic feel about them, very futuristic for the 60s. And then, of course, there's the cathedral itself. 
And this is the ruined part of it, of course, um, which has various sculptures kind of left around it. Um, you can see here um, a sculpture by Jacob Epstein, um, Eke Homo of, of, of Jesus. Um, and here we are in the inside the cathedral itself and the reconstructed cathedral, which has, again, this huge quantity of 20th century art um, within it. And it has, again, various things donated from other cities that were, that were destroyed in the Second World War. Probably one of the most interesting of these kind of donations is um, as part of the Belgrade Theatre, which is the main theatre in Coventry, which was designed by Arthur Ling in the 1960s, um, and was so called because of the fact that, as you can see here, um, lots of the materials here, the generous gift of timber, were given by um, was given by the city of Belgrade to Coventry, and here you can see a bit of the interior. Um, and this kind of idea, you know, Belgrade had been very, very heavily bombed um, during the war as well, and this kind of idea of providing links was seen as very important. Not just links with Germany, not just links with you know the, the previous enemy, but also links across the Cold War. So. I think Coventry, if one can say this about one city, had a sort of neutral position in the Cold War. It, um, you know, it, it, it encouraged working with places like Yugoslavia and East Germany, as well as with um, Rotterdam or um, Cologne and cities in the West that were bombed. So here's um, another one of these plaques. This was left um, in Lidice Place. So Lidice was um, a, a town in Czechoslovakia, which was completely destroyed um, by the Nazis um, to, um, as a punishment for the assassination of the Nazi official Heydrich. And these plaques, these plaques and monuments you can find almost everywhere in Coventry, um, connecting it with other cities. So, you know, this kind of internationalism and this kind of interest in kind of commemorating peace and so forth expressed through art was a really important part of the reconstruction. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some later things that happened in the reconstruction, some of the later, more kind of dramatic buildings um, so buildings in the late 40s, 50s, early 60s are in a kind of soft modernism, I guess. A lot of natural materials, decoration, um, you know, still some kind of interest in classical traditions. And then in the late 60s and 70s, it gets a lot more brutalist and a lot more dramatic. So this is the Coventry Sports Centre, um, which is now a bit of a cult building in Coventry. You can get it on, you know, you can get it in badges, get it on T-shirts and mugs. It's currently derelict, actually, but, um, you know, it's it's increasingly popular. Um, here is a, a, a kind of sculptural wall by the artist William Mitchell in the Bullyard Shopping Precinct. Um, so again, much more kind of avant-garde um, approaches to art. And there were a lot more towers built in that era in the city centre, some of which have since been demolished, such as this one, Coventry Point. And they were very much about kind of redressing what were seen to be problems in the first reconstruction, which was that mostly... It was a city of shopping. Um, it was a sort of shit city of shopping and bureaucracy, basically. That's where the shops were, the markets were, the department stores, the city council, the you know the the art college, the technical college. But people didn't live there. So um, two housing towers were built, um, including this one, which is is now gone. Um, to try and kind of build more of a kind of life to the city after the shops would shut 
And I now kind of want to move on to talking, I suppose, about some of the more some of the other flaws in this plan and some of the ways in which it kind of fell into decline. Um, so alongside the kind of sweeping away of those medieval streets for these kind of, you know, open, pleasant public spaces was them being swept away for roads. The city has a very tight inner urban ring road, um, which essentially was to, you know, this is a city that was built, as rebuilt for cars. It's a city that made cars, a city where most people would drive cars. And you can see that in the city centre. Um, Sometimes it's reasonably nicely planned. So here you can see how, you know, it's kind of elevated above some quite nice green spaces. It's sort of, there's a lot of places where this is more chaotic, um, such as Birmingham, very near to Coventry. But the point remains that a lot of central Coventry looks like this. And this was particularly heavily criticised after Coventry faced industrial decline, mainly from the early 1980s onwards. Um, so it was really a city in the 50s, 60s, 70s of migration. People moved there in large numbers from the rest of Britain and also from um, places that had been previously part of the British Empire, such as the Indian subcontinent, the Caribbean, um, there were expanding industries, there was a need for labour, and a lot of people moved there. And as the kind of British industry in general kind of first started to decline in the 80s and then started to collapse in the 90s and 2000s, um, this kind of, uh, you know, kind of modernist city of the car began to seem a lot less... Um, a lot less utopian, a lot less, a lot less popular, and was a lot more criticised. Um, those of you that know, you know, that, 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 that uh, music fans will know Ghost Town by The Specials, um, the Coventry group, The Specials. And Ghost Town was very much about this process where this post-war boom town, very confident, very kind of um, bustling, um, you know, was basically kind of hollowed out when the industry left, leaving very high unemployment, particularly among young people, particularly among black and among Asian people. Um, and really, in some ways, the city has never quite recovered. I mean, it's never quite been as bad as the early 80s since, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not had a particularly easy history. One of the first things that's important to talk about is that the city no longer owns its city centre. The city council no longer owns it. Um, gradually, piece by piece, each part of it has been sold off to developers, frequently to shopping mall developers. And that has impacted the clarity of the design so here you can see how in the 1980s, between the precinct and the cathedral, this kind of big postmodernist shopping centre, um, which is called Cathedral Lanes, was built. So this really, you know, it goes right, it's sort of built right into that plan, breaking it up, basically. Um, replacing that kind of image of order and sort of high-minded civic building with one based much more on commerce. You can see that especially here. This is what, until very recently, the main precinct looked like. Um, the, you know, sort of 1980s paving, um, the huge escalators, the kind of um, the big glass roof at the far end, which is actually still there. Um, these were all imposed when the city centre was privatised upon that, um, that sort of civic centre and turned it from a civic space into a basically just a, a money-making space. And the original design was very, very severely compromised. Things got a little bit better 
in the 2000s, certain things happened that were quite positive. Um, there started to be more investment in the city centre, partly because there were more students in the city. Um, the old technical college had expanded. The University of Warwick continued to be very successful. So the Herbert Museum, the art gallery I showed you earlier, expanded massively with this um, rebuilding project, which you can see here. Um, and there were a few kind of little schemes for kind of cafes that, and so forth that were all right. But most of the architecture has been like this. So very, very poor quality um, in a city apartment buildings. Um, badly built, badly proportioned, architects not really involved, um, built right up to the street with no public spaces. Um, this is pretty typical of, sort of second rank British cities in general. But in somewhere like Coventry, where pretty much everything that was there was there for a reason, you really notice the difference. You notice that this is there purely to make a fast buck. Um, also in the city centre, Coventry is lucky enough to be one of the few places to have a city centre IKEA. Um, so again, you know, this kind of city where everything is there for a reason and everything is kind of connected to a story that the city wants to tell itself and tell other people, you know, the city of peace, the city of democracy, a city of reconstruction, is sort of replaced with one where the city is, you know, the same as any other and has a big blue IKEA, the same as any other big IKEA. There's been demolition of a lot of post-war buildings. Um, this uh, tower next to the railway station is no longer there. And there have been some more positive examples, some of which came with the capital of culture idea. So last year, um, a lot of art events and musical events and so forth happened in Coventry as part of this kind of um, this regular event. Um, some of the public spaces, like this 1960s arcade, were given quite imaginative reconstructions. Um, others were just left, again, sort of derelict or near derelict, like the bullyard. But also a lot were listed. So Coventry was given a kind of new problem, I guess, or a new kind of opportunity by the fact that historic England, <coughs> the main conservation body in the country, listed um, about 10, I think, kind of buildings or squares in the city which now have to be preserved. So most of the historic, of the kind of post-war centre is now under preservation orders, which mostly, at least with the local government, is very unpopular. Um, what they want to do can be exemplified by this. So this is um, a proposal for the centre of Coventry by the American firm Jerday Partnership. Those of you that know Warsaw will know the Zwarte Terrasse um, shopping mall next to the Vosette Centralne. Um, and um, it's the same architect. It's, you know, again, could be absolutely anywhere. And this idea of the city as a place that had a story to tell, that was important, that was connected to other cities in this complicated and interesting way, is very much rejected in favour of this sort of global monoculture. Um, so that's roughly the position now. And I think that's kind of where I want to end it for the moment. So um, I think there's all sorts of sort of um, different, there's all sorts of different kind of lessons and ideas that come out of that Coventry experience. And so many of them are kind of obviously tied up with particular ideas and design. Um, the fact that this was very strongly a modernist city, an anti-traditional city, which had very little interest in kind of reconstructing what the place looked like before the war. But it was also a city which was cared about quite 
intensely. It was a city which, you know, had a, had something it wanted to say to people and say to the world. Um, and a lot of the kind of message that it wanted to have was very much about it being a kind of city of peace, being later a sanctuary city for migrants and refugees. Um, and, you know, it had this kind of, um, I guess, quite sort of, I think you could say utopian, you could just sort of say kind of, uh, you know, sort of decent and democratic kind of idea about what a city should be. But it also had significant problems and flaws, such as the, um, you know, the, 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 the way it was centred on the car, centred on driving, centred on the motor industry. The fact that it never really had a replacement for industry, although it's continued to be a very important city for education, it's gone from being a city which had a very small gap between rich and poor in the 1960s to one that now has a very large one between particular parts of the city. Um, and it's also one which has kind of lost its confidence rather than kind of, you know, seeing itself as, you know, a kind of unique city that wants to preserve its uniqueness. It very much wants to be a kind of global city like any other global city. Um, so within all of that, I guess, there's all sorts of things we could kind of talk about. Um, of how this relates and doesn't relate to the current situation. So I'm really interested to hear what you think. Thank you. Thank you for inspiring lecture, Owen. Uh, thank you for sharing the knowledge about all the advantages and uh, things that were not going so smooth that everyone expected. It's really interesting and um, um, I can see the difference between the countries since I, I was honored to study at the Architectural Association. So I understand that the countries are, in some cases, totally different, uh, even though they are willing to gain the same uh, qualities of life and uh, the same qualities of human freedom. Uh, at the same time, we have groups of questions. I think we, we have two uh, most different groups. First one from the audience and the second one uh, from the organizers. Mm -hmm. And I would say if we will be really brief in uh, answering, we could cover even all of them. That's right. If, if, if you don't mind. That's so, right. So I grouped all of them into different categories and I would like to start uh, announcing the questions from the audience. So the first group of questions is related to them. Um, let's say the start is about start. So uh, many people are willing to know what to start with. Mm. I will not describe it any further. We can answer. Yeah, I mean, in any sense. what to start with? I mean, I think... It's kind of a tautology, but the crucial thing is to kind of work out what to work out what it is you want. Um, you know, do you want to? And I think, in a way, that's connected with a question which might come up later about how satisfied you were or were not with that city before the war. The really crucial thing with Coventry is that a lot of people involved in its replanning were not satisfied with the city as it existed before 1940. And they saw its reconstruction not as a way of rebuilding what was there, but of building something that they wished the city had been, that they felt that it was not. And that was a crucial point. Um, and that's a difficult one, because I think a lot of people, one of the first things they want to do, actually, is get it you know, back to the status quo ante to kind of, you know, rebuild something as much as possible like the, um, you know, like it was before it was destroyed. But, you know, very much depends, I think, you know, uh, on the city and on, on, on who you're talking to. Um, but that was a really important point here is that feeling of dissatisfaction with the existing city. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, here we have lots of similarities in this mm -hmm. case. Uh, 
Thank you. Okay. The, then the second, the second area or the second field of field of questions are related to the uh, timeline and stages, and also about mistakes avoidance. So, could you tell us a little bit more about the priorities, timeline, and stages from your so point of view? Priorities and stages. Um, that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, what I'd recommend there is if you found any of that interesting, you should read um, Jeremy Gould's book on Coventry. Um, he works for, it's published by Historic England. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but if you just look up Jeremy Gould, Coventry, he goes into a lot of details about what happens when and, and in what order. And obviously the first thing was, you know, clearing debris. Like clearing, you know, the, the destroyed buildings. Um, then, but you know, also the plan came very early, very early. You know, the reconstruction of Coventry was basically planned before the war even finished. Mm. Um, several years before, in fact. And gradually its ideas were kind of reinterpreted, and you know, they were all slightly different from the plans. But the basic ideas of the plans remained. So um a kind of pedestrian centre, publicly owned for public spaces, surrounded by a, you know, kind of um, wide uh, inner ring road. And that beyond that sort of new green suburbs, often kind of high density and high rise. Um, and that, I think, is roughly the kind of border it, it happens in. And, you know, the then obviously you're into you run into something else which is the plan being kind of gradually kind of dismantled after the 1980s um what was the second point there there was a second point not on timeline but just uh, timeline priorities um also um the mistake avoidance mm. so in terms of priorities i mean it's interesting how the housing it was quite slow, much slower than probably should have been. Um, so rehousing, and again, there's there'll be a lot of similarities here. The first wave of rehousing was in prefabs, so-called. Um, so, you know, um, usually single-family houses um, built in factories, and some of them still survive in the area. There's a lot in Birmingham, for instance. Um, and that's the first wave. And then these are gradually replaced with um, new kind of high-rise blocks and more kind of collective blocks and, you know, largely with trees and so forth. And a lot of people actually resented this. Uh, the prefabs were often more popular than what replaced them, although they were also more badly heated and so forth. Um, so that's an important, an important point, really, is, you know, there's a kind of, there's a stage of the reconstruction that doesn't survive which is the one of kind of the prefab houses. That's a really interesting little, little side issue. Um, on mistake avoidance, obviously a plan has got to be flexible. For a plan to be successful, it has to be able to respond to problems. And in some ways, Coventry managed to do that through two things, one of which was the fact that it built this new housing in the centre, so that meant that, you know, it, it it did still have a kind of multiple use of some kind rather than just retail, because that was a problem. And the other is the fact that it had the technical college, which is now um, Lanchester University, in the centre. So that meant that there was kind of activity and street life in the centre. Um, but, you know, planning for a single use um, as a single industry, which is more or less what Coventry had, or at least a series of connected engineering industries, um, meant that when, when they collapsed, you know, you didn't really have anything left. So that was a problem. And also, of course, you know, mistake avoidance, like, you know, if something changes in fashion, you know, can you adapt to it? And something changes in planning ideas, can you adapt to it? And it's very hard to adapt that inner ring road. You know, you could maybe convert it to trams or something, 
you know, you could have like, you know, say there's electric car only or whatever, but basically that inner ring road is very difficult to kind of reimagine as something in a kind of post-carbon future. Um, it's very polluting and very kind of car central. Um, so I guess that, you know, looking at the current era and working out what, what, what's happening now that we think is permanent and what do we think is a transient phase and, you know, trying to look kind of 50 years in advance is something they didn't always do in Coventry. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's an interesting point about the, the circular road. And the next group of question is related to, uh, maybe, you know, people think that you should you should know all the answers to all the questions <laughs> and uh, uh, to, to, to give the immediate solutions, but still we can try to, to spread your knowledge. Um, so it's just uh, to, to share, to share it to people, I mean. And uh, uh, it's utilitarian questions about, the, about such thing, things um, as, for instance, the necessity of bunkers, and the, uh, not necessity, but the probability or like the, the, the building of glass structures. Mm. Uh, I would say uh, my answer to the glass structures is uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, totally possible, but uh, it should it should be what should be done in architecture is medium range missiles to prevent the demolition of glass structures. Maybe you have another another opinion, and also temporary issues, uh, temporary issues of uh, temporary uh, shelters. Mm. Uh, of course, there are. Uh, lots of answers um, in terms of reuse, in terms of uh, building building something temporary that could be a constant and so on. But yeah. anyway, you can you can answer yeah. this group of questions. Um, the second is much easier to answer than the first. Um, so I think it's incredibly hard to make a modern city resilient to 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 that kind of bombing. I don't think anywhere ever has. Um, I think that in this particular case, I'm going to narrow this down just to this particular case of Coventry. The problem when it was bombed was how closely built everything was. So that meant that fire spread very easily. So the fire just went across the city center. And that's one of the things that they were looking at at the time. It's like, this is what happened. And this is one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons why the new city was so spacious was, you know, that kind of sense of not wanting to have this kind of huddled city where fires just go, you know, cut across it. And also how many of those buildings were wood. You know, a lot of the medieval city was wood and, you know, had kind of wood, wood structures. Um, and obviously they were, you know, burned to the ground. Um, so that was their concern. And I think the war... After when, when they were building the city, even though some of them were, were, you know, socialists and communists, they all thought there was a possibility of a new war and that that war would be with the Soviet Union, but that they thought that that war would be a nuclear war. And so there was no point in trying to kind of proof the buildings against nuclear war because you can't proof the buildings against nuclear war. They will, you know, you will still all die. Um, so actually... In terms of bunkers, Coventry, like a lot of other cities, did have a system of, of world war, of, of bunkers for the Cold War um, under government buildings, kind of municipal buildings. Um, but they could have taken only about five percent of the city's inhabitants. You know, they would take the top people and they'd hide in a bunker, and you know, there was no democracy about it. It wasn't like during the Second World War when actually there was a very developed system of civilian shelters, you know, that the so-called Anderson shelters, the Morrison shelters, um, that these, um, there was nothing like that during the Cold War because it was impossible. And I think it's it's not, in the current situation, you'd, you'd have to speak to an engineer. Um, but I, I don't think there's much that can be, done um certainly bunkers are probably a better solution than trying to work out how to make 
you know, buildings bomb proof. Um, so on the second point, um, I mean, the really, I, 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 you know, the, although it's a side issue in the story, the prefab story is really, really interesting. And if, you know, most of the things I'm talking about are long term. You know, the replanning of Coventry really took 20 years. You know, the kind of the, 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 a kind of complete city wasn't really finished until the early 60s. And so that's 20 years after the bombing. Um, so at the current moment, probably it's a lot more relevant to look at the prefab program. And that was happening during the war, and it happened for a few years after the war. And in some cases, it was literally the same factories that would be building kind of tanks and aeroplanes were also building housing and rolling out these almost complete prefabricated houses. And not in a kind of, you know, now there's often this idea, which I think is, you know, um, a bad one, um, that, you know, shipping containers or what have you should be the future of refugee housing, whatever. But, you know, shipping containers are not, a house is not shaped like a shipping container. You know, these, this is not, it's not good housing. And what's interesting about the prefabs is that they responded to an emergency situation in which housing was desperately needed because so many people, hundreds of thousands of people have been made homeless by the bombings, but they were given temporary housing that was very good. And that temporary housing, you know, in a few cases even still survives. Um, so that's a really, really interesting kind of, side story okay okay uh even though uh, ukrainian cities are not so dense as european and uh, they are not built out of timber they are also totally burnt and demolished so <laughs> it doesn't preserve them mm. uh anyway, anyway uh, another question is about the uh, one of my favorite i would say uh about the I, I'm not sure if you have this word, but in uh, Soviet and Ukrainian science, uh, especially in architecture, we use we use it quite often. The qualimetry, the the um, the metrics of quality. Mm -hmm. So, what are the methods of uh, qualimetry regarding the uh, cost efficiency and uh, uh, yeah, cost efficiency in rebuilding? the uh, new residential uh, residential blocks and uh, also is there any possibility of uh, the materials reuse in your opinion yeah um the materials reuse point is really interesting and um i actually don't know of many examples of it in britain um it was a huge thing in um in poland for instance um Lots of Warsaw, the reconstructed Warsaw is actually built with bricks taken from um, what were previously German cities that were destroyed. So like Breslau, later Wrocław, Danzig, later Gdansk. Um, you know, bricks were shipped from these destroyed cities on trains and on trucks to Warsaw to rebuild Warsaw. Um, so that was a really obvious example. And obviously meant that later when they came to reconstruct Gdansk and Wrocław, it took a lot longer because all of the bricks have been taken to Warsaw. Um, but the, um, you know, that, 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 there was loads of reuse there. I don't really know of many examples. And I think partly that's because of the fact that so much of what happened in Coventry, although they preserved some ruins and they even managed to preserve and partly reconstruct some wooden buildings, Um, about 80% of the city centre is new and it's new and it tells you it's new and it's concrete frames and steel frames and, you know, it, it, it tells you so. So there's very little um, kind of retention of materials, partly because some of the materials like timber were just burned to the ground, um, but also it very much wasn't part of the planning ideology of the time. You, you know, the era I'm talking about, 50s, 60s, 70s, is even more than now an era of obsolescence. You know, a thing, you know, a thing, everything was disposable. Um, you had new materials, you used them for a bit, you threw them away. It's the era of, you know, archigrams saying that a building is like a packet of frozen peas. You know, it's like, 
<laughs> that's kind of the time we're talking about. So it's not a thing they thought about, but it's certainly a thing we should think about now. Um, the other point, I've, again, I've lost it. I should be writing these down. Uh, other point. Um, to, 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 to the quality matter. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there was there was strict standards, um, other standards which a lot of new buildings in Coventry don't follow. Um, but they were generally about space more than materials. Um, so all of the housing was built to uniform space standards, which are now pretty good. Like, by contemporary standards, the new housing was, you know, big flats, um, much bigger, actually, than the stuff being built um, that looks similar in, um, in Poland or Ukraine. Like, um, the high-rise blocks that were built in Coventry have much bigger flats than those built. In, in Eastern Europe. Um, but the, um, the material quality mm, varies, it varies. Um, most of it's pretty badly insulated. Um, doesn't particularly take, you know, extreme heat or extreme cold very well. Um, it's not there's often a kind of a carefulness of materials, I guess. Like if you look at the railway station is a really good case in point in Coventry. It has a listed modernist railway station and it's just kind of like, it's very simple kind of like, st very simple kind of stone floor and some good wood work and a steel frame. And it's just, it's cheap but good, I guess, some of it. And some of it is cheap, but it's just cheap. By the way, is it true? I heard the story that uh, the average uh, height of the uh, of the British apartments were something like two meters, forty centimeters, uh, because of the uh, heating problem, or oh, not not a problem, but a heating solution to to heat less volume. Of yeah, air. yeah that's about right. I mean, they, they they often have those flats that they're, they're, they're wide rather than high. I mean, I'm currently in a 1950s um, post war reconstruction um, right now. Where I live in London is on the site of a V1 rocket attack that, um, of 1944, um, which destroyed a row of houses. Um, the missile was fired in, in, in 44, and the reconstructed flats, yeah, they, they don't have high ceilings, but they, they're, they're wide. And they almost always a dual aspect. So they have, you know, window there, window, window there. Yeah. You, you almost never get single aspect housing in post-war Britain. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, then we have questions regarding maybe the topic of our previous lecture, the young girl. Mm -hmm. So uh, people are asking about cities for people. So is there any opportunity to... Um, of course, of course, they are uh, there are, but uh, still, what what are these opportunities to make to make uh, cities more people friendly? Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, some uh, some private properties uh, became public spaces, as I understood, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, what are the opportunities and uh, what should be taken into consideration in maybe changing codes and. Uh, Mm. And regarding new master plans uh, structure, okay. new new yeah. city scheme. Those are two quite different questions. So on the first one, yeah. the first one, you know, if you look at old footage of post-war Coventry, it was, you know, it was always very popular. Um, it's not a kind of like a Bourdieu ville radius where, like, you know, had, hardly anyone on the street. Like, it's... It was always very bustling and kind of is now still. And on that level, I think they'd successfully created a kind of, um, you know, a, a sort of popular space that people enjoyed using. Um, and it didn't follow all of the Jan Gale rules, let's say. It's not on a traditional street plan. There's no kind of, there's very little kind of things like active frontages. Um, and I don't think that matters. I don't really think that's that important. What I think is important is that it, the, the the usage was often far too monofunctional. 
you know, so um, again, you know, so much of the city centre was just a shopping centre. And that really does mean that with a couple of exceptions, particularly around the university, um, it does shut down at six o'clock, you know, and, and you're then in somewhere that's basically empty. And that's that's the case of a lot of British cities in general. Um, that's the case of a lot of British cities that weren't bombed and weren't reconstructed, that they die at six o'clock. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's very much connected with that kind of idea that the city centre is just for shopping. And it being also about people kind of living in it and working in it and, you know, kind of going out in the evenings has taken a long time to gradually happen in Coventry. So you mean even if uh, these places are providing uh, public spaces or half public spaces, uh, it's it's quite um, limited. It's limited. It's limited. Yeah. Um, and um, that is very much a kind of consequence of the fact that I think that kind of, you know, when, when these things were kind of um, owned by the local authority, there was a degree of flexibility in so far as they could say, okay, there's going to be some flats, some, some flats here and the university is going to be here and you could kind of um, see it as something other than shopping. But when it's literally owned by a shopping mall developer, which most of it currently is, it's a different question. You know, their, their, their interest is in shopping and just in shopping. Um, and that that has been a real problem. Um, do you know, sorry, do you know any solutions addressed to to solve to solving this problem in the world? Well, I mean, currently a lot of those developers want out because um, it's not very lucrative anymore. Things like you know e-commerce and so forth um, means that a lot of those high streets are kind of derelict. You know, there's so so much of central Coventry is sort of derelict or semi-derelict. And there are two kind of possible solutions to that. One of which has been to kind of take them and turn them into residential spaces, which is quite a, which generally doesn't work very well because that's not what they're designed for. And so they often are quite poor quality residential spaces, particularly offices when they're turned into flats. Um they're 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 not much they're, they're not very good. Um And the other is lowering the rents. So the best bits of kind of, of, of Coventry in general are those that re reflect how multi multicultural it is, which, you know, it's one of the most multicultural cities in Britain. And the most lively bits are the bits where the rents are fallen quite low. And so that's where you get, you know, the Asian supermarket, the Bulgarian deli, you know, the Turkish restaurant and so forth, you know, it's in, in those bits. And there's very little of that in the city centre because the rents are so high. And I think that, so I, I think in a lot of cases, developers actually don't want to be involved anymore because it's not profitable. But it's often the local government that can't see anything else to do with it. They, there's a sort of generation of people who basically came into politics in the 80s who are very, very resistant to new ideas in cities and very much have this idea that, like, you know, what we want here is more shops. And if there's more derelict shops, we need more shops. And, you know, there's, they don't really have much of a kind of, you know, a very creative response to this problem. Um, but actually... In some cases, you know, like you could buy them quite cheap off the developer because the developer doesn't want them. And, you know, there's some cities in Britain like Preston where there's been a lot more interesting stuff done with those kind of city centres and kind of, you know, bringing in kind of more cooperative um, businesses and bringing in more kind of like you know, small-scale businesses and community-run stuff and so on, and which has worked much better than Coventry. Okay. The next answer, the next question is very popular among Ukrainians, and I think I I know the answer for sure, but I want the audience to hear it from you. Mm. So, uh, uh, so how do you... Uh, how do you think? Uh, what do you think about new buildings in historical areas? And also, um, uh, should be uh, should it be the new buildings or the total copy of demolished architecture? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, this goes right back to the first question, which is deciding what it is 
you know, thinking about that city and deciding it, what, what you liked and didn't like about it before it was destroyed. Um, something like, you know, so of the cities that have been really, really bombed, um, I don't know Mariupol, I've not, I've not been. I know Kharkiv, okay. I know Kharkiv a little bit. I went there quite a while ago now, but spent a little while there. Um, and <gasps> there's so much tied up with sort of symbolic questions and, 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 and you know, uh, that it's very, very difficult. So Warsaw and, you know, that kind of Warsaw Coventry contrast is really, really important. For Warsaw, the destruction of Warsaw was seen as being about, was done by the Nazis to obliterate Polish culture. Very, very consciously. Um, there was no military reason for destroying Warsaw Old Town. It was destroyed as punishment. And it was destroyed as a way of removing any evidence that there had been a, you know, a, a, a Polish culture, a Polish Renaissance, a Polish Baroque. Um, these things were survived in Krakow, but the Germans just said they were German instead, and so they got away with it. Um, but the um, so the reconstruction there was really, really important to people. And partly, I mean, you know, partly, you know, it was done by a communist government and it was done as a kind of act of, of populism. But it was also done as a symbolic thing to say the Germans have failed. You know, they wanted to obliterate our culture. The reconstruction shows that they failed. And something like Coventry is different because the Germans' main kind of racial um, dispute with Britain was, you should be on our side, but you're not, so we're going to bomb you. But they considered, the, the Germans considered British people to be fellow Aryans, you know. We were, all, we're also a Germanic people, so, you know, um, they imagined a future in which we would be allowed to exist. The Germans did not imagine that Poles and Ukrainians could exist and have a kind of an independent cultural or political life and, a, and their own distinct culture. They didn't. And they wanted to destroy the evidence that they ever had. So there's a really, really, really big difference. Um, and here, I think some of this is reflected in the current moment. There is a lot of talk by people like Putin about Ukraine not really existing. It's not a real country. It doesn't really have a culture. Any culture that it has is just Russian culture. And so in that context, it's very understandable that people would be like wanting to assert, no, we do. This is what it is. And if you destroy it, we're going to rebuild it. But again, how much do we connect that to the cities we're talking about? So... You know, what would what is, you know, the kind of Ukrainian building culture of Mariupol, let's say. You know, the, the, you know what I mean? There's a kind of question of like the Germans destroying Mariupol to destroy Ukrainian culture, they're destroying Mariupol because, you know, they're fighting an incredibly sadistic war in which the main aim is to completely kind of destroy that city at this present moment. So um I think a lot of things there'll be a symbolic point. You know, people will want to reconstruct the theatre in Mariupol, for instance, because it's so symbolic that that theatre was destroyed, you know, when people were sheltering in there. It's such a, you know, that, that it would be very, very weird if someone were to kind of go, we're going to build a completely new building on this site because of that symbolic significance. And that's very similar to Coventry Cathedral. You know, the, 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 the thing there with Coventry Cathedral was there was never any prospect that the ruins would be removed and you would build on top of the ruins because it was so symbolic that this medieval cathedral, this kind of great work of Gothic architecture from the 14th century, would be, you know, the, 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 its destruction was such a sort of symbolic act that obviously it had, what was left of it had to be kept. But, well connected to something completely new. So you've really got to take it case by case. Um, I think that a lot of the time that kind of Warsaw approach can work in certain circumstances, but it can often be very kitsch. Um, if you were to look actually at Dresden, it's a really interesting example, because in Dresden, most of the reconstruction is much more recent. Like some things like the Zwinga in Dresden were rebuilt in the 50s and 60s, but most of the kind of historic buildings of Dresden were built after 1989. And in my view, they look terrible, basically. 
And I didn't, and I don't see those actually the reconstruction of Dresden. I don't see like Coventry as being this kind of as a very much a kind of uh, you know it's a sort of anti-war gesture and a peace gesture and so forth. Whereas the reconstruction of Dresden in the two thousands, I see as much more just a straightforward conservative gesture. It's not it's not aimed at the Nazis. It was aimed at East Germany, if you get me. Um, so um, it really depends. Kharkiv, for instance, you know. Kharkiv has a, a center, one of the most important modernist ensembles in the world. You know, it has Dershprom and so forth, and it has all of these constructivist buildings. And some of them have suffered war damage, like the Slovo building, um, and some of them have not. But basically, it would be weird if they were not restored to something like what they've been like before, because they're so important historically. And they also show a kind of, you know, so many of them are from that 1920s moment in Ukraine that's so important. Um, so, you know, certainly people will want to kind of rebuild that quite a lot. But we're not dealing with, in a lot of cases, and this is why, I mean, you've got to take it case by case. Um, you know, cities of like great historic kind of pre-modernist architecture, by and large, not under attack at this point, by and large. Um, you know, Odessa, Lviv, you know, um, Ivana Frankivsk, you know, these, these are not the cities that have been destroyed, like Kharkiv and Mariupol are being destroyed. And if they were, then you would face that question of what you do with this history, you know. And there you face the really big problem, which is can the contemporary construction industry imitate the buildings of the earlier era? And mostly, yeah. You can tell the difference. So the center of Kiev, you've got the St. Sophia on one side of the square, and you've got the Golden Dome Monastery on the other side. And speaking for myself as a you know architectural historian and snob, I can immediately tell which is the reconstruction and which is the original. You can see that St. Sophia is a, you know, is 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 the building that was built in the 10th century and then, you know, expanded into the 18th century. You can see that it has the signs of age, it has the signs of the materials being high quality. You can see that it is, you know, a historic building. And on the other side of the square, and I know it has its supporters, but I look at that and I'm like, well, I can see that was built in the 90s. And I don't know, it's not for me to say in many ways. It's not, it's not, you know, I, I just think there's a, it raises a lot of issues which people have to take on their own merits. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think that maybe we are running out of time, but still I, I have at least two more little questions. And then if you have time and if um, the organ organizers want to I want to want me to ask a few questions uh, from the second list, let's say. Mm -hmm. Then we could continue a little bit. But let me know, please, if you, if you hear us on... Uh, okay, so I, I have some notifications and updates. Okay, so uh, let's speak about these two mentioned questions. Uh, the students are asking uh, what should be or could be the student roles in terms of serious rebuild. And um, also Ukrainian architects are uh, thinking that uh, they, are, they are interested if uh, they will have work or maybe, maybe the work will go to... Uh, mostly foreign architects, like, uh, for instance, Norman Foster, as I, as yes. I mentioned, booked Harkiv. Yes. Baron, Baron Foster. Um, yeah. So, of oh course, I, yeah, the, the, the foster Kharkiv thing. I mean, who was, someone did a photo montage of Foster's buildings in uh, Astana, or what was it now, Nur Sultan, in Kazakhstan yeah. into Kharkiv, and I think that says it all. Like, that's not what you want. <laughs> um, you know, like, I think if you were to go to um, the capital of Kazakhstan, whatever one chooses to call it, um, it's a great example of every way, everything not to do in town planning, um, for the most part. Um, car centered, 
um, segregated, unequal, you know, full of terrible public art. <laughs> so, um, and the Foster buildings are probably the better buildings there, but that's still, you know. And again, so much of that is expertise kind of beamed in from elsewhere. Foster, Kurokawa, you know, all these people kind of like coming in there and doing trash. Um, so on that point, one of the things that's really, really important to the reconstruction of Coventry, um, and one of the lessons I think that it has that is important, is the importance of the city architect and of a good city architect. Um, pretty much everything that happens there, you can link to um, the fact that throughout the reconstruction, from you know the beginning in forty one to you know it kind of being basically finished in the sixties, um, there's an office of a couple of hundred architects working at the city council, working at the town hall. Mm-hmm who are very talented, some of them architectural association graduates, some of them locals in Coventry, some of them from other places, but they all had to live in Coventry, work in Coventry every day. There was, apart from the cathedral by Basil Spence and the university by Eugene Rosenberg, um, pretty much everything worth seeing in Coventry is by a, a local architect who lived in Coventry and worked in Coventry, and that was their life. And that is very much how I think it should be in Kharkiv. You know, Kharkiv has a very good, as we all know, has a very good new school of architecture. It's always had, you know, an important architectural culture. Like, those are the people that should be at the forefront. Um, And in many ways... There are certain, it's not to say there should be no buildings by, um, you know, by foreign architects, um, you know, or or no buildings by architects who are not from that city. I mean, you know, the most important building in post-war Coventry is the cathedral. It's the great building of the the project and it's by a Scottish architect. Um, But everything else is all about this team that is there every day. And that, I think, is absolutely what should be done. And I think it should avoid that kind of awful kind of global culture of master plans, you know, where the same kind of firms do the same master plans for every city and they all look basically identical. Um, you know, the kind of Jerde scheme for Coventry is very much an example of that. And, you know, I think Kharkiv would be wise to avoid that if the reconstruction were given to the Kharkiv School of Architecture rather than Foster, I think it would be a lot better. Okay, then thank you for an honest answer. Um, also, um, the the guy or maybe, maybe, yeah, so, um, it's one more one more interesting question um, about your opinion to um, opinion to a political incident. So, do you uh, do you support the uh, the country decision to uh, stop the uh, stop the uh, friendship with the friendly? friendly city of Volgograd mm-hmm. as a reaction to demolishment of, of the Mariupol? Uh, difficult. Difficult. Um, I think divesting from Russia is something I support, like refusing to cooperate with Russian institutions, refusing to have cultural links, I would support. And in this case, I suppose that would mean ending that kind of formal link with Volgograd. But there are some things in it that make me uncomfortable. Um, one of which is a tendency that I think people have to read all history, everything that happens back into history. Um, you know, I don't think, um, and that it kind of very much contrasts with that kind of ethos that, that was behind how Coventry was, was rebuilt which was often people kind of like, you know, in a city that had been flattened by Germans to then, they then, you know, after the war made links with the Germans. Um, And that's not, which is not about forgetting what they did at all. In fact, the exact opposite. 
it was about you know that kind of almost a sort of there was almost a brotherhood of destroyed cities that Coventry was part of and that that I think was a, an, an important thing and it built bridges across what was then a very divided Europe and um, a lot of people benefited from those bridges um, so I don't know I would probably I would probably be in favour of keeping it purely as a rhetorical thing that it's um, that it's still twinned with it while taking at well suspending any kind of continued link or continued cooperation um, you know I can only imagine what the you know that the people that the city council of Volkograd's opinions on the war and I can imagine that they're you know I imagine they're very supportive of the war and I would I think it's fair to not want to have anything to do with people that support this war in any way whatsoever. Um, but I do think that you can't blame the people of Volgograd in 1943 for the actions of Vladimir Putin and the Russian government in 2022. And I think that's an important point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a difficult one because it's, you know, we're, we're talking so much about something that's happening now and, Perhaps in future, when there's a Russian government that is sane, um, some of those links could be rebuilt. Um, I think at the moment, breaking them is very unsurprising. And I, I you know, I, 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 I might have my opinions on it, but I certainly wouldn't protest against it. Yeah, it's crucial for Ukrainians to know the, to understand the uh, international reaction. Thank you. Uh, also, people are wondering, uh, they have this a certain question. I think uh, it will be a quotation. So, uh, what data do you need to collect after the war to make the right and effective decisions quickly? I will add uh, for myself that now it's an epoch of um, of big data, of collecting data of different kinds, different parameters, and of course, when uh, commentary was destroyed, there was. Um, much more, much poorer possibilities to to collect and operate data. So, what what benefits or what opportunities are we facing today? I mean, one of the things that I mean, I'm not an expert on this on this question, but I mean, the amount of data is off the scale at this point, which also makes it very difficult to cover up atrocities. For instance, you know, like the the attempt to kind of uh, you know. Um, say that Bucho was a false flag or whatever, it's very easy to disprove because there's so much satellite information, photographic information, enormous quantities of data where we can actually look at that and go, well, no, actually you did this. Um, so that makes, you know, so it has those possibilities, but it also, in many ways, it raises another problem when you're interested in reconstructing a city of how, what do you do with this enormous pile of data? Um, there were significant kind of like, you know, kind of data gathering things that happened in World War II, obviously. Um, the bomb damage maps that were produced by a lot of local authorities, the London County Council had a huge bomb damage map, which you can now, now buy a reprint of for some reason. Um, so, you know, they, they, they did what they could, but certainly the amount that we have now is vast and in many ways the problem is one of clarity rather than quantity um but yeah this is a it's the sort of thing that like forensic architecture would know a lot about and would have a good answer to but i don't okay uh, so uh, the organizers said that we, if if we have time, then we mm -hmm. we can have it. We can sure. uh, do it more, uh, like uh, twenty or or twenty five minutes more. Mm -hmm. So I'd like I would like to ask you, do you have time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. Yeah. I'm not sure how many listeners are joining our conversation right now, but I think that there are many of interested people who are who are still here so uh some other questions yeah um i think that uh the interesting question for uh ukrainian society and ukrainian architects 
and developers as well, is the architectural competitions because in Ukraine uh, we don't have the high quality culture of architectural competitions and usually uh, everything is happening without without it and uh, even if uh, the competitions are um, are on the scene then nobody cares about the results mm. and um, they sometimes it's not taken into consideration the the yeah. winners the w- winner projects and so on so uh, uh how do you think how how crucial architectural competitions are in this that, 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 that's a kind of that, there's a good and a bad side to them i think um the good side is one of publicity the you know a, a, a good architectural competition leads to the issues of that building or that plan being discussed publicly. You know, it's in the newspapers, it's on the internet, everyone's talking about it. And that's usually a good thing, is to have that kind of oxygen and publicity around around a project so that, you know, so that you get some sort of sense that it isn't just being sewn up behind closed doors. But also it encourages a lot of the time sort of star architecture. You know, it encourages people like Foster and so forth and, you know, to kind of uh, compete with kind of expensively rendered CGI projects that probably won't get built. Um, so, yeah, it's it has its uses. Um, and certainly, actually, with the kind of examples I've talked about, there was an element of that. Like the early, you know, I showed two different plans, quite different, that kind of come, came from that era in 1941 when different people were proposing different plans for the city. And, you know, they would be publicly shown. You know, they'd be in the newspapers, they'd be on, on in an exhibition, and so people could kind of go there and discuss them and think about them. So that's a good thing. It's just, it, you know, one has to be careful who one invites. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, also, also, could you answer answer to another question then? Uh, yeah, the private uh, the, the the issue of the private property um, and the nas- nationalization mm. process. Um, uh, uh, in, especially from from British experience, mm. and also maybe the uh, the structure and the the whole amount of <laughs> financing of this pro- of mm. of these processes, who who uh, who, um, who financed the the process of commentary build mm. and uh, what's different now in in the Ukrainian scenario because it, it's it will certainly be a, a European or maybe the global Marshall Plan. Mm. And uh, was it was it the same for uh, Coventry? So, I mean, it happens at a very odd political moment, which is very very hard to replicate. Um, where I guess for various reasons strength of the trade union movement being one of them, there is this sort of attempt to provide this kind of compromise between socialism and capitalism. And Coventry's rebuilding happens in that context. And you can't imagine it without it. It's crucial to to what happens. And that doesn't mean that big business and private business is not part of what happens, actually. It is. Um, You know, the industrialists, the kind of big kind of interest in the motor industry and so forth, were generally in favour of the reconstruction because it meant that they you know they could get their products through much more easily um they could you know they could get the materials through to their factories they could sell more cars you know it was it, 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 so it's not and they were also invested a lot in the new university and the war in warwick university a very very major investment from from big business so there was a capitalist element to it but in large part it wasn't hugely different what happened in Coventry at that point to what happened in in a lot of Eastern European cities. But I mean, one difference, I suppose, Warsaw, all property in Warsaw was nationalised after the war. 
like all kind of, um, you know, even suburbs or the city centre or wherever, the entire kind of, uh, the whole of the land of the city was nationalised. Whereas in Coventry, it happened in pockets. So the city centre, the new housing estates, and the rest was left alone. Um, And, you know, it, it, it did make it vastly easier to do what it is that they wanted to do. And if you compare it with other reconstructed cities at the time, such as my hometown, um, Southampton, which was also very heavily bombed in 1940, um, the reconstruction there is not interesting, (laughs) partly because of the fact that, like, the old owners kept their their sites um, and they wanted it rebuilt basically as it was. Um, But the buildings were less interesting. Um, and, you know, it, it didn't have the same kind of importance as Coventry. People wouldn't go to see it like they went to see Coventry. It just, they just rebuilt it without really thinking about it. It just happened. Um, whereas for Coventry, the kind of, the fact that they had this kind of grand idea in 1941 and then they could have like actually built it all, built pretty much the whole of their idea, it would be impossible if they hadn't nationalised it. And, uh, and also the, the kind of equality that was so important in that era would have been very, very difficult otherwise, because, you know, it, it basically this was an era in which most of the housing that was built was public housing. So, you know, there was no, um, you know, estate agents and landlords and so forth, you know, had nothing to gain from what was happening in Coventry. They weren't a part of that process. Um, so, you know, I... It's 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 a, it's a, it's a, that, that, that you know it's very very important. But the question of the money and how this was how this was paid for, um, I mean, one thing that obviously happened at that point, which is notable in the Ukrainian context, is enormous rates of tax for the rich. Um, the top rate of tax, you know, um, in the fifties and sixties and seventies was like ninety percent and above. Um, you know, this is why the Beatles wrote Tax Man. It's because the Beatles had got so rich that all of the Beatles' earnings was being taken by the British state so that they could build public housing and Coventry Cathedral and such. Um, you know, which I think is good. And, you know, it's not like the Beatles were homeless. Um, you know, that, that, but there was, you know, that, that one of the major things that did fund this was the fact that you had progressive taxation. So, you know, the, the, and, and people made, mostly accepted it. A few people went to Switzerland and put their money there. Mostly, you know, the equivalence of, um, you know, Dmitry Fertash or um, Runa Akhmetov or Yuhok Kolomoisky were taxed to a level that is now unimaginable. Their money was taken and spent on, you know, on the reconstruction. Um, and also land values were just cheaper. Land was cheaper. And that was that that helped a great deal. Um, various reasons why land was cheaper, um, partly the, the war damage, partly the way that the economics of it worked at the time. Um, the state had the right to buy land at its nominal price rather than the price that it would be if you sold, you know, there's complicated reasons why they were able to buy land more cheaply, um, which again make it kind of um hard to repeat. Um but yeah, I mean. It's interesting because it was so much poorer a country in 1945 when this started. You know, much less rich than Britain is now in in 1945. And yet it did this enormous capital project, far bigger than anything that would happen in Britain now. Um, And yeah, I think think uh, it shows that's possible. It shows that somewhere that's actually quite poor can do something quite dramatic. And I think that involves a willingness of all parts of society to take part in that, including, you know, the enormously rich who currently do not take part in those sorts of things, except by, you know, funding the occasional art foundation and setting up their own political parties. Very interesting. Incredible. I didn't know about so high uh, rates of, of taxation. Um, also, we know uh, that the mentioned Baron also lives in Switzerland. <laughs> okay, 
Uh, so maybe maybe you have uh, some like um, maybe if you don't like this uh, question, you 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 can you can avoid it. But maybe you have some quick uh, tips and tips and tricks for Ukraine. Like you know that for sure you shouldn't do this, and for sure mm -hmm. you should do that. Mm -hmm. Like it, of course, we need to analyze lots of criteria and so on and so on. But maybe some obvious cases or obvious um, um, obvious uh, activities, and also maybe you'll provide some uh, sources to to read to to understand more. Yeah, I mean that's not so easy off the top of my head. Um, I can maybe kind of go back and to a little reading list later on. Um, but um, yeah. would be nice. I suppose some of it is points I've already kind of suggested. Um, with the foster point is a really important one here. You know, I cannot stress enough, and you're the ideal people for me to make this point to, I cannot stress enough the importance of there actually being like local expertise and like local knowledge in city planning and actually doing a decent enduring city plan like um you know and there being like you know an architectural school there that is good that has some power and has some influence within the local government um and you know that is able to kind of and there being a kind of public sphere in which you can talk about these things properly it's just of incalculable importance and you know the current model of how you do these things in the region, I guess, is sort of exemplified by something like, you know, Kazakhstan under, under Nazarbayev, um, or actually even Georgia under Saakashvili, where it's really kind of like, let's get the Western celebrities. And let's be, that they can parachute in and do their great works of architecture. And, you know, that's, for one or for the odd one-off building that's fine but that's not how you plan a city that's not how you rebuild a city and that's not how you create an enduring architectural culture that can last for decades um and so i think definitely people kind of pointing that out would be good um the uh, and you can see why someone like foster you know if he's like us you know everyone wants to do something to help it's understandable blah, blah, blah. but like it's unhelpful i think um, in terms of um, best practices and so forth, there's so much literature on post-war rebuilding, um, I don't even know where to start. Um, it's probably better if I just do a reading list after, I think, because yeah. otherwise I have to go to the book bookshelves and yeah. <laughs> see really what helps. But yeah, I'll do that after, I think. Cool. Okay. Okay. And maybe... Maybe um, you could express your your uh, like in the end of our conversation. Could you express uh, any wishes for for us and for Ukraine to support people because some people are really suffering and um, uh, the the good words are really helpful for like to, to 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 not not to succeed but at least to resist yeah. and to, to to live a more normal life than it is yeah. so yeah i mean i suppose the example of coventry is is you know just i suppose it has a kind of like these things do end and it did end and you know that there was a kind of process of 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 rebuilding and reconciliation that created something that was better than what was there before. You know, the 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 the, the city that people lived in after World War II, people were happier and healthier and lived longer lives and were better educated and and, and just lived better than they did before 1940, than they did before the bombing. Um and that was really, really, really important to people then of like it wasn't just like, we are going to beat these bastards. And that was important. And they were going to beat those bastards. And they did beat the bastards. And that's very, very important. But it didn't end with that. It was also like, and we're going to make sure that this never happens again. And we're going to make sure that we build something that is better than it was. And that, you know, that 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 was a, a, a really kind of great 
I think, thing that they managed to do that. And I think that's a thing that I think shows that even in those kind of incredibly kind of bleak circumstances that those things are eventually possible. But I mean, the first thing they had to do was actually beat the bastards and that, that hasn't happened yet. But I very much believe it will. Thank you, thank you, Owen. Thank you, um, thank you for your architectural and his historical support. Thank you to your government for supporting Ukraine. And I think this support is something that will uh, lead us to the to the better future and to the win in this battle between good and bad. Or uh, <laughs> let's say let's say like that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, organizers, for uh, for organizing such an interesting conversation. Uh, thanks to all the audience for being with us for almost two hours. I think I think that people who, who were not able to join us will um, will find this interesting afterwards. Thank you, Owen. Thank you very much. I think we'll. See you uh, during the next conversation. Maybe not with me, but with Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.